Hi, my name is Sirius, and I'm the host of the Pan Podcast. Welcome. Now, if you've listened to our podcast before, you might have already heard me say this line at the beginning of a previous episode. Now, is this an accident, or might it be a habit? And what is a habit exactly? How do we form a good one? And how do we lose a bad one? And how long does this process take? Now, to answer these questions, and to find out even more about the fascinating topic of habit formation, I'm very honored to speak to Dr. Philippa Lelli. Philippa is a psychologist and a senior research fellow in the Department of Behavioral Science and Health at the Institute of Epidemiology and Health of the University College London. For more than a decade, she has been extensively publishing on the topic of habit formation, behavior change, and health with a specific focus on weight control. Now, obviously habits influence pretty much every aspect of our lives, including nutrition. So without further ado, Let's learn more about this fascinating and important topic of habit formation and health from Dr. Philippa Lelli. Pippa, maybe first of all, I would like to, th to thank you for being here. And you, you've told me via email that you are just in the middle of setting up a trial, or maybe you've, you've already finished it by now, but I can imagine that you have very little time to spare. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very thankful that you're here with me uh, to talk a little bit about habits. Yeah, okay. you're welcome. Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, so I've, I've uh, researched your work a little bit and I saw that you've, you've been extensively publishing on habit formation for almost 15 years now. So this, this seems to be something that, that, that's your main focus of, of interest professionally. And um, I find this incredibly interesting as well. And as, at least as far as I can tell from, from the research that I've done is that habits really influence pretty much every aspect, every aspect of our life, right? Also when it comes to our health. So, so we're deciding on what to eat or whether to do sports or you know, whether to do yoga or meditation or something like this and whether this can stick as a habit, this really influences our health long-term. Um, and I find it peculiar that we don't, really, we don't really think about habits conceptually at all. At least I didn't do that before I got into, into your research and before I heard your, the, the talk of your, your colleague, Dr. Gardner. Um, I think that we sometimes think about behaviors and maybe on, on New Year's Eve when we have our New Year's re resolutions, we think about habits as well. But conceptually to think about habits is something that we sort of don't do, which I, which I find a bit strange, but I'm very happy that we, 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 can, we have the opportunity to do that today. Um, so before we get into all the, in, into, into details and before we get into the application of, of habit formation and habit change, let's maybe define our terms and talk about the different terminology that, in my opinion, needs to be defined to understand to understand the, the area a little bit better. So as far as I can tell, and co correct me if I'm wrong, there are a few terms that might not be intuitively understood very well, which may, maybe is behavior. Another one certainly is habit. And then there are some other ones directly connected to habit, maybe triggers and, and contextual surrounding. Um, so if you have any to add, please do so. But maybe you could define the basic terminology so that we can uh, get started uh, and, and, and later talk about the applications as well. Yeah, so I think one thing that's very difficult in when trying to talk with people about the concept of habits is that in our general language, um, people often use the word habit to mean behavior. So they just mean things that we do quite often. And we can do things often for a number of reasons. We can do them because habit is di guiding our behavior, but we can do things repeatedly because we've made a conscious choice to do that. Um, and that's those are different motivations for behavior, different drivers. Um, so when I talk about a habit, I mean a behavior that is performed, well, sorry, start that again. When I talk about a habit, I'm, I'm talking about the process that leads us to perform a behavior. And when I'm talking about a habitual behavior, that's the outcome of the habit process. So. Um, when you've repeated a behavior frequently in the same setting, you form a mental association between that setting and the behavior. Um, and that leads us to when we encounter that situation again, we experience an impulse consciously or unconsciously to repeat that behavior. And that's the habit process. And so some behaviors are things that we do habitually and some things we don't. You could call the situation which triggers or, or cues the behavior when a habit is um, operating could be called a trigger, a cue. Um, there are different words for it, but it's something to do with 
the setting, the context. It can be an internal thing like hunger. It can be an external thing like when I walk past a particular shop or when I walk into my kitchen first thing in the morning. All sorts of things can be can be a cue, um, but it's the repetition of that behavior in that setting that is what leads to to a habit. Mm -hmm. So that would be, for example, something like brushing your teeth, right? That's that's what I often hear when it comes to habitual behavior. I go into the bathroom in the evening and it's 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 a bad time before I go to bed. I brush my teeth or when I get out of bed, I go to the bathroom and I brush my teeth. Would that be an accurate, accurate description of such a situation? Yes, and you usually don't have to force yourself or think I must remember to brush my teeth. It just happens and you continue on with your day. Um, and some habits, depending on what type of behavior you're talking about, some habits you don't remember if you've done them or not. So um, sometimes I walk out my door, I'll get down to the end of the road and I'll go, oh, did I lock the door? Because it was so automatic, it was so habitual, but I wasn't paying attention to it. And then I'm not actually sure that I've done it and I have to go back and double check that I locked the door properly. Um, other behaviors, if we're talking about something like physical activity, Nobody thinks that you're going to go for a whole run and then not remember that you went for a run. Um, but the instigation of getting out of the front door, you know, in your running gear um, can happen and, and proceed quite automatically without without having to think, oh, do I want to go on a run? Don't I want to go on a run? Oh, it's a bit raining. Oh, I'm not sure. Or I'm a bit tired. Um, if you have a really strong habit, um, you just and you, you, know, you have a regular routine of exactly when you go, you just get up on a Tuesday morning, put your running gear on and go for a run, whatever else is going on around you. Um, and, and that's something that's sometimes quite difficult when you talk about habits is you can define behavior at different levels um, and the extent to which something is automatic, it depends potentially on the level that you are at, but habits can play a role in all behaviors that are repeated behaviors. If, if it's an entirely novel thing that you've never encountered before, at that point, habit is, is not relevant because you're going to have to make a decision based on the information you have available at that, that situation based on what's new. Um, and that's why new situations are so tiring for us um, because we don't have these habits to, to rely on. You've got, you know, when you start a new job, you've got to work out where your desk is, where the kitchen is, where you're going to get lunch, Where are the toilets? Um, all of these things, which then take up your time, which mean for a little while, you're probably going to be less productive in your work day because you're busy working out all these, these things. Um, whereas if you've worked in the same place for a long time, everything proceeds easily um, and you can focus on um, whatever you're supposed to be doing in your, in your work or your meetings and so on. Yeah. Yeah, so habits seem to be, I mean, you talked about, you, you, you used the word automatic, right? And there's another word that I think is, is used quite often in the literature, automaticity, right? So if, if a habit becomes automatic or if this, um, if automaticity occurs, that really opens up a lot of, a lot of cognitive space for us. We don't have to think, I, I actually, in, in um, researching and preparing for the podcast, I thought about being on vacation. So this is a totally new scenario and none of my habits work there. I don't have any habits when I'm on vacation. Um, I, I was in Mexico just two years ago and I, I thought about that vacation. That was not the last vacation that I took and there were no habits for me. But in, in a few days, I, I spent some time, I think two or three weeks in a row at one place and new habits formed, which was interesting retrospectively to think about that. But the automaticity part is really helpful, right? So I Is, is that something that is ingrained in us from, a, from an evolutionary point of view? Do you think that this is, um, because it seems to be something that, as I said, or as you said as well, it opens up a lot of capacity for us cognitively. So we can do much more. We can do, become much more productive. So this seems to be habits themselves or habitual behavior, whether it's good or bad, seems to be something that's, that's, um, that could be, at least so that's, that's my question, it could be, um, evolutionally, evolutionary, um, evolu evolutionarily, right? <laughs> yep. um, sort of uh, saved in us to, to, um, to, to have an advantage, to have an evolutionary advantage. Yes, I think it, it is. And, and you, you see it in, in animals. And that's where, um, you know, some of the original habit research comes from mm. is training animals to do things. Um, and then it's always interesting trying to transfer that literature into into humans um, who obviously 
have more capacity to reflect upon their behaviours. Our habits influence what we do a lot and probably a lot more than most people would like to acknowledge because we like to think of ourselves as being in charge of our own actions. Um, although we do then like to have the excuse of habits sometimes. So sometimes if we, you know, a lot of people would, you know, they have a behavior that they, they know that they really probably isn't ideal. They'll say, oh, it's a habit though. So I can't do anything about it. And that, I mean, that's true. It's true that it's difficult to do something about it because it's a habit, but it doesn't mean that you can't do anything about it. But we do like to think of ourselves as autonomous beings who make our own choices. Yeah. Don't really like to acknowledge that a lot of our behaviours are influenced by the context that we live in and the environments that we are in. Both our conscious and our less conscious decisions are influenced in that way. If you live somewhere where you have access to lovely green spaces, um, where you can go and exercise and be outside, you're much more likely to go outside than if you live in an inner city where it's quite dangerous to be out walk on the streets. Um, you're not going to choose to go for a walk in that, in that setting if you feel in danger. And, and even on smaller levels, we can we can set up our own environments um, to be more conducive to the things we want to do. So if I want to eat certain foods and not eat others, well, I can choose to have certain foods in my home and not have other ones there. Mm. Um, and even if I even if I do have chocolate and apples in my house for, for some reason, um, I can choose to make the apples somewhere really accessible and the chocolate less accessible. So I'm. So I'm more cued to eat the apple. Mm -hmm. um, if I have a really strong chocolate eating habit, it's going to be difficult because I'm then going to have to, you know, I know where the chocolate is unless someone else has hidden it. Um, but, and if I want to go running in the morning, when I'm trying to develop a running habit, it's great to prepare that ahead of time. So I know where my trainers are. I know where my leggings are. I've, I know where my headphones are if I want to listen to a podcast while I'm running. Um, so it's all set up. So I wake up in the morning and it's all right there. Well, rather than wake up in the morning going, oh, I don't remember where my leggings are. I don't know where this is. I can't, but it's going to take me too long to find it. I'll just not bother. Mm -hmm. um, so we can set up our environment. And, and even, even once the habit's developed, if you continue to set yourself up, it continues to trigger you and help you and, and make sure that those behaviours continue. Um, so yeah, we can create create our worlds for us to some extent to promote the behaviors we want to do and make the ones we don't want to do more challenging. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So we've, we've sort of naturally segued into, into, um, into the, the process of habit formation, right? You just, you just talked about that when you, when you want to go running in the morning uh, or you, for, for me, for example, it's when I want to get up early. I know I have to put my cell phone. So, so my alarm, somewhere else than next to my bed. I have to put it like a couple of feet, a couple of meters away from my bed so that I have to get up and maybe have a glass of water there, drink the glass of water and then, then be able to do it much more easily. So let's talk a little bit about, I think to understand, I mean, there are basically, basically I think there are two things people would like to, or we would also as health professionals would like to help our patients change, be, change their, their habits as in um, forming new good habits and in, 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 you know, decreasing the amount of quote unquote bad habits. I mean, all behavior is adaptive, but then practically there are good and bad habits, I guess. So um, what, could you walk us through that process? How does a, how does a habit form? How, how does that work? So at its most basic, it's very simple. It is just that you do the same thing in the same situation over and over again. Um, but obviously in real life, that's, not as easy to achieve as we might like it to be. Um, so if you want to do something, you need to make sure you've conceptualized it at the right level. So if I said, I want to have a healthy diet, it's a huge, broad goal. Um, and I, I don't know what habits I need to form to do that. So I need to work out what the specific behaviors are. So for, I could choose, I really want to focus on fruits and vegetables. Um, but even saying I want to eat more fruit and vegetables isn't specific enough. I need to work out what fruit and vegetables I'm going to eat, when I'm going to eat them, make a really specific plan. So I might say I'm going to have a piece of fruit with my breakfast every day as one of my habits uh, or one, one of my potential habits. Um, then I need to make sure I've got the fruit <laughs> and so that I can. Um, and then I need to try to remember that 
when I get to breakfast time. Um, so you can um, repeat plans in your head. So when it is breakfast time, I will have fruit. Um, my children do this. I make them repeat their plans three times when I want them to remember something. They now do it. They do. That's now a habit for them. They do it automatically without me having to tell them. Um, or, you know, you make stick a post-it note on your fridge or lay it out the night before, but something that's going to help you remember when you encounter the situation the first few times um, until you think that you will remember anyway. And then if you do that over time, it will get easier. Every time it gets easier to, to, to do the, to do the behavior. Um, and it will, it will slowly become, become automatic. Um, so it's simple in theory, um, it just depends on identifying really good cues that are things that are reliably going to happen. I recently, for some reason, I'm a habit researcher, but even habit researchers struggle with this thing. So I've been really struggling to take my vitamins in the morning for some reason. And I think, and it's because my breakfast habits aren't very consistent. Um, on working days and weekends, I eat breakfast in different ways and different times. Um, so I've had to, so rather than trying to have my vitamin with my breakfast, I've changed it to having it with my cup of tea because I always have a cup of tea when I first wake up. In the morning. Yeah. So you need to think about having a cue that is, is reliable and easily identifiable. Um, if it's something that's associated with loads of things in your life, it, it can get muddled. Um, so breakfast, like meal times are really good because you generally only eat breakfast once. Um, as long as you are a breakfast eater. If you're not, or mm. you're inconsistent, it doesn't work. Um, so it's about identifying really good cues that you that are going to be obvious to you when they happen and that you can associate the behavior with. Not being too ambitious, as in not planning to do something that you're actually going to hate. Mm. Um, because we're not very good at making ourselves do things that we, we completely hate. Um, and if you need to do something that, that really isn't very enjoyable, I guess in, in a medical setting, sometimes people do need to, I don't know, checking your blood sugar or something. If you have to prick, if it's not very enjoyable or some medications aren't, don't taste very nice and so on. Mm -hmm. Any way to make that more enjoyable. So associating something that you can do during the behavior that makes it more enjoyable at the time or, re or some form of reward afterwards. So if you need to take a medicine that doesn't taste very nice and, that, and it isn't contraindicated to eat around it or something, you know, have that and have a breakfast that you enjoy or something like that. Um, with running, we often um, talk about listening to a podcast while you're running or, or, or the radio or talking to a friend on the phone. If you're not so puffed out, you can't talk. Um, to, just because then your, your brain associates that habit link with a reward and the more rewarding it is the more um the stronger the habit links likely to be the reward needs to be close in time to the habit so it's it although self-monitoring is is a really good way to check in if you have done it so if, it, if if you were trying to create a whole load of habits you could have a list of them on your fridge and at the end of the day tick off which ones you've done that would be good to make sure that you don't sort of forget that you're trying to do this in your life, but that's that's not part of the reward that helps the habit form. The reward that helps the habit form is that in the moment it's rewarding or, or the second you finished, um, there's some form of reward. Um, but the best sorts of rewards are, um, are not sort of given by someone else. It's not someone else running in the door and paying you five pounds when you've taken your tablet or something. Yeah. It's an internal, it's something motivating to yourself. So a lot of forming habits, it's very simple theoretically, but in practice, it's about knowing yourself and knowing what will what you will find motivating in the moment um, so that you don't get to the time that you were supposed to do it and then decide not to because something else is more interesting or more attractive or you know, the behavior just doesn't seem appealing at that time. So I would like to touch on one thing that you've mentioned, the reward, because when I thought about habits or now I know correctly that a habit is the process and then it's the habitual behavior. So now I will, I will correct my wording here as well. So when, when we think of, when I think about um, habitual behavior, I think that, or at least I would propose, and I would be interested in what you, what you think about that, 
that good behaviors, behaviors that will be um, helpful for us or healthful for us in the long run, might not have a direct reward. For example, when I go running, I mean, I might have a good feeling after I go running, but if I eat a donut, I have the, the direct experience of pleasure because I eat a very sweet and very fatty food. So it seems to me as if good habits or good habitual behavior ha had its rewards a little bit later than potentially bad uh, habitual behavior. Would you think that that's accurate? Yeah, and I think that that's the challenge with um, all health promotion is that the behaviors that we would like people to do have rewards in the future mm -hmm. and the behaviors that we'd discourage people from doing have re immediate rewards. Um, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't need health promotion or public health or because every, we'd all be doing the things that are good for us. Um, and that's why you sometimes do need to add in a different kind of reward. So with the running, adding in a podcast or listening to the radio. So most people, once they, not everybody, I'm a runner, so I do enjoy running, but I appreciate that some people don't. I used to hate it, completely hate it. Um, but I built up slowly and, and, and came to love it. Um, but even now, I still look forward to a run, not just because I enjoy running, but because I know I get to listen to my audio book. Mm -hmm. And if you set up a rule for yourself, like I'm going to listen to audio, this, these audio books, but only when I run, mm. it makes it part of that behavior. Um, and it makes you look forward to it. Um, with food, it's trickier. Um, and there is some trial and error, I think, if you're trying to change your diet, um, in finding foods that you do still find enjoyable, even though they are healthier. Um, and you do, I, your taste does change over time, I think. Um, so it's like having sugar in your tea. If you stop having sugar in your tea after a while, if you then have sugar in your tea, you think that tastes horrible because it's too sweet. Um, and if you stop eating um, cakes and biscuits and things so much, they do, they are still delicious, I think, um, but less, less, I think you can find more pleasure in the foods that you used to think all oh, that tastes healthy in a bad way. Um, you know, um, so it, it wouldn't be a good idea to try and create a habit to eat something you genuinely dislike eating, um, if at all possible. But there are so many foods in the world that hopefully people can find healthy, healthy foods that they do enjoy. Um, and that's the most sensible thing is to, to choose things that are good for you, but you do enjoy. Um, mm. And acknowledge that it is when you're breaking a habit, which is different from making a habit, mm -hmm. it will take a while for you to, if you're still encountering the situation where you used to, do that behavior you will still experience that impulse and have to choose not to do it so if you want to break a habit the best thing to do is if you can work out what the cues are then avoid them mm -hmm. if it's mm -hmm. but it depends what the cues are so if it's that you always buy a muffin from a particular bakery on your way to work if you can walk a different route then that's you know you've sort of solved it to some extent in that you can plan a different breakfast walk a different route so you haven't got that temptation at the moment you're walking past um and that will be easier but obviously many cues are being in my house and <laughs> i can't never be in my house or being in my workplace or um you know certain things that you you can't avoid um so in that case one option is to try and substitute one habit with another mm -hmm. so if i know i have um I snack on something unhealthy every, you know, 11 o'clock every morning. Um, if I can substitute that for a healthier snack, um, then that's going to be a good thing. And it means that you, you, you don't encounter the situation, experience an impulse to do something and then have to just not do anything. Um, you can, you can still do something so that it gives you an alternative action, um, which is, which is easier. Um, because then over time that alternative action will become a stronger habit than mm. the previous one. So you should then experience the impulse to do the new one. Now, 
we don't know how long that takes for the new the new habit to overrule the old one um and it may be that we don't really know that much about cues we can all identify in our in our in personal lives when i walk into the bathroom in the morning i brush my teeth but we don't really know what it is about the bathroom in the morning that triggers the brush in the teeth is it seeing the toothbrush is it seeing the toothpaste is it just knowing it's the morning is it that you have a feeling in your mouth because you've just woken up and your mouth feels different than it does at other times um and we don't know if if i have a, a snacking habit at 11 o'clock in the morning is it the hunger is it walking into the kitchen is it what what's cueing me and it may be that it's a combination of things and a lot of people eat more when they're in when they're feeling stressed or feeling worried so it might be i've never really thought about this as kind of a new thought <laughs> but it might be that if i'm not stressed then my new apple eating habit can overrule my chocolate eating habit. But if I'm stressed, the chocolate eating habit somehow rears its head again. Um, but I don't know if that's part of the, if, I feel like that might well be the case, but I don't know if that's part of the habit mechanism or something else happening in that moment. There's a new research question right there. Yes, yes, I <laughs> trying should tell. To get people, trying to get people into stressful situations or an unstressful, situ relaxed situation, and then and see uh, which cue wins over. Um, yes, yeah, yes, it would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But ideally, if you want to break something, I think if you can, uh, avoiding the cue is the best thing. And yeah. if you can't, then sub trying to come up with a substitute behavior is a good approach. That's really that's really good information. I never thought so. I, that's that's also a question that I had is whether, so now I know it, it differs between getting rid of bad habits and, and forming new habits. So what would be the best route? So now we know what the best route to, to um, sort of discourage people from bad habits is. So get a, eliminate the cues if it's possible. If you know what the cue is, eliminate it. And if it's not possible, try to um, change the behavior that follow the, follows the cue, right? For example, when you, I mean, with a muffin, you could also try to walk past, or that would be, yeah, that would be changing the cue again but you could walk past a shop that sells vegetables. But if you can't change the queue, maybe you can change. Um, I'm just thinking about you sitting in your office and then every time, I don't know, the clock hits 12, you always uh, eat a muffin, but you could also have a, I don't know, have an apple on your desk. Sort of these, these yes. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, what, so it, yeah. if you're in your office, you can, you can have controlled the environment ahead of time. So you don't have a muffin, you only have an apple. Um, It just depends how close you work to the shops, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> There, there's two things with habits. One, if it's a really strong habit, you can have done it before you even realize that you've done it. Okay. And that's a big problem, uh, which could often happen with things like sugar in tea. So if you, you're making tea, if the sugar's there, even if you've planned to stop having sugar, um, you'll just put it in because you're thinking about a hundred different things and then you start drinking. Drink. And if you've been having sugar as well, it won't even trigger you that it tastes weird yet because you haven't yet um so you need to change the environment and get rid of the sugar so that you can't take this you know you will open the cupboard and go where's the sugar and then that will bring it into consciousness mm. and at that point it's not about the habit so much but it's about your motivation at that point um, to continue with with your plan to to make this change so with avoiding the cue so if i if i've controlled my environment so i have an apple on my desk instead of a muffin mm. Um, that will be my only option and if I go for it and I go oh it's an apple and it's not a muffin that mm. will bring it into awareness and at that point it's about how much I want to stick with my goal of eating more healthily or whether I'm going to then go actually I'm going to pop to the shops and buy myself that muffin <laughs> yeah yeah so maybe before we talk you, you touched on the on, on goals twice now and I would like to talk to you about that as well but um, so maybe let's let's postpone the the how to form good habits and let's talk about goals for a second. What do you think about the um, the separation of or the the sort of the notion be, of goals versus f focusing on goals versus focusing on the process? Because it seems to me as if habits are a process, and then habit formation seems to be a process as well, and incremental incremental changes over time. So do you think it's more helpful to focus on on a specific goal? Or do you think it's more process and more helpful to focus on the process that it entails to get to that goal? Or do you think both have, have, have an equal share 
Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? I think you need both. If you mm. want to form habits, you need both because you need to know what your goal is and then you need to break that down into making concrete plans mm. for the habits that you want to form. Um, if you don't know what your goal is, then you, you're not going to sort of know what to plan. Mm -hmm. um, and, but you, and remembering why that is your goal and what's motivated you to want to do that, that becomes important in order to keep you doing the behavior for long enough until it becomes a habit. And also if you're, if you're breaking a habit to, to bring it when it comes into awareness, you need to remember what your goal is so that you're, you're to help you stay motivated to, to want to, to make that, that healthy choice in the moment. So if you're trying to be healthier, you need to remember what, what, all the reasons, why do I want to be healthier? What are the benefits? Um, yes, there is a cost to me right in this moment when I'm missing out on my muffin, but mm -hmm. ultimately in this much time, you know, it's gonna, do people care about eating healthily for different reasons? You know, for some people it's about weight management, for some people it's about um, health, a specific health outcome, like managing a health condition or preventing occurrence of unhealthy, of, of, of various conditions. Um, but remembering why, why that matters to them Mm -hmm. is going to be important in situations where they don't want to do the behavior yeah yeah so let's let's talk about how health professionals can implement it um, in in their practice uh, we've talked about the medication example for, for a bit maybe we can you can you can maybe elaborate on that and then you also touched on weight loss just now and i know that you've published on on uh on the topic of weight loss as well so excess weight and, and adiposity is really one of the biggest health problems that we have and many, many diseases are directly linked um, to, uh, to excess weight. So that might be something that's very interesting for all health professionals really, no, you know, um, not dependent on, on which, which uh, specialty you work. And so um, what could be practical advice for a patient when they come into the office and say, you know, I've, I've, I know that I weigh too much, I know that I have, have, I have health problems because of that, but I don't know how to get, you know, I've tried many different diets, but I don't know how to lose the weight. Do you have any, any advice for health professionals, how they could help these patients with, for example, with, with a lifestyle intervention or also with, um, with taking the medication regularly, because this seems easy, but it's really not. I mean, taking medication regularly is really, I mean, we have to face it. It's something that people usually don't really do regularly. Um, they might, if, if, if they go to a veterinarian, they, they might do this for their dogs or for their cats, for example, but oftentimes they don't do it for themselves. So yeah. do you have any advice on that front? Yeah, so I think in terms of medication, um, the best thing to do is talk through with them when they need to take it. So sometimes there are, are rules around, you know, you need to take it before food, after food, that and that, that limits when people can take it. And then it's trying to work out with them what happens in their day at those times. You know, when would be a, when would be a good time in your day? Not not time as in um, ten o'clock, but a good setting within your day in your in your routine. Um, and talk to them about that. You know, trying to find a situation that happens every day at an appropriate time in relation to when the medication needs to be taken, um, and trying to and and what could remind them. So. You know, it can be very, and the difficult thing with talking about habits is that it seems so obvious, but we still don't do it. Mm. Um, so giving advice can somehow feel, it can feel like it's too obvious to even say, but it needs to be said because mm. people aren't managing. So literally, if it's, if it's, are you going to do it when you first get up in the morning? What's, you know, if, if they have a good toothbrushing habit, can it be something they, can they take the medication just before they brush their teeth? Or if it needs to be after breakfast, can they stick a post-it note on the fridge or on their cereal bowl or, or whatever is the setting? And you can't, I mean, one option is to just use um, phone reminders, but people do have a tendency just to mute them. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, and I think they get muted when they're not in the right setting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if, if somebody always has breakfast at six o'clock in the morning, that'd be quiet, but at six o'clock in the morning, then you could have a phone reminder that goes off at six o'clock in the morning, but it only works if they're the kind of person that always has their phone with them and reliably is in the same setting at the same time. Because if they suddenly, um, at the time, at that time, they've actually gone out to walk the dog, then 
then are with their medication. So the reminder goes off, they, they mute it. They think, oh, never mind. Yes, I'll do that when I get home. But when they get home, they've forgotten. Mm-hmm. So I think situations are potentially better cues than external reminders. Um, but having the external reminders might be a good backup. Mm-hmm. Um, just talking to them about if you if you aren't someone that you can do it and you have to mute make sure you set it again for 10 minutes later or 20 minutes later don't just turn it off and rely on your memory because we're all too busy and our memories fail us um but it would be better if it's a setting because then that will become become a habit Mm -hmm. and also i mean self-monitoring for medication i think is quite good so um having somewhere where you tick off that you've that you've done it um to keep keep that in mind so it's not you don't get to three days later and go like, oh I can't remember what medication I've taken or not mm. um weight loss is obviously a massive very complicated uh topic mm. and habits I do think habits are important but they are only one part of th- the reason that we have um this this problem of, of overweight and obesity in in our country or in the world um so it is a lot about context um and i personally do think that the the best way to control um eating in your home is to control the food that's in your home um which often is about whole families um because if one person in a family is trying to manage their weight and everybody else in the family isn't and isn't supportive then that can be difficult because they're going to get very upset if suddenly there's all the food that they want to eat isn't available that's one really good way to develop good habits is that's what you know that that's the food that's there and that's the food that you eat regularly planning is very important um sitting down and, and working out what you're eating and when you're eating it in order to to try and change that um, and working out what are the cues for unhealthy behavior, which are the sit- situations where, um, where you're eating food that, you, that isn't what you ideally would when you look back on it and working out if you can change those situations or, or working out different strategies in those settings. So I think that's very important. Um, one of our, re- our published a paper recently about the importance of of habits that you haven't done for a long time so if you're if you go on some a form of a diet and it works because it's it's you know got strict rules about what you can do and when you can do it and you sort of change everything when you start coming off off the diet and sort of trying to eat a bit in a bit more of a a less strict way um old habits even if you haven't done them for six months or a year can very easily creep back in um and so it's important to to know what those things might be because otherwise you just slip back and uh, ben gardner often likes to call them dormant habits although um, not everybody likes that term but he what all he means is that they're sort of sleeping habits so they're still there um that mental association between that setting and, and that behavior is still there yeah, if it's not inhibited, it can it can still still dominate. I think we all know that when we visit our parents, right? Yeah. <laughs> Some old, really old. I mean, dormant. I I I just from from hearing it the first time, I think dormant behavior seems to be an appropriate term. I feel like that uh, when I'm in my familiar situations, as in as in my 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 family with my siblings or with my with my parents, you know, that's really a different, totally different scenario, and and uh, yeah. old behaviors. Uh, pop up that I thought that I had, you know, maybe dealt with, um, and and that usually don't come up in any other uh, social situation. So yeah, I can. I, I can. It's very funny, it. isn't it, going back to your siblings? Yeah. So maybe as as a last question, and people, I want to be mindful of your time as well. Um, I think people will be mad if I don't ask that question. How long does it take to form a new habit or to I know or to form new habitual behavior? I know you've published a paper about this in two thousand eight which has been um, cited many, many times. Um, and I, I know that you've come up with a, quite a different number than the 20 to 21 days that are so often brought forward in, in 21 day kickstart challenges or uh, something of, of that sort. So if you could uh, talk a little bit about how long it might take for someone and so that people have realistic have a realistic view on, on, on habit change as well. Okay, so the easy part of the answer is Definitely more than 21 days. Yeah, good. Yeah. 
the difficult part is there is no there is no magic answer because it depends on what the behavior is it depends on the setting um it depends on what question you're really asking as well because you could be asking how long does it take to uh for it to feel somewhat automatic or you could be asking how long does it take to reach the most automatic level that it's going to reach because we found in that study that the shape of the, it's a habit formation curve. If you plot time by automaticity, it goes up quite steeply to start with, mm. and then it slowly, slowly plateaus. And at some point it's, people experience it as getting no more automatic because it, it's reached its sort of maximum for them. Also it's about, are you saying the number of repetitions for it to feel automatic or the number of days? Um, because some behaviors are things that we do multiple times in one day and some things are things that we do once a week um so there is no nice answer because it's a more complicated question mm -hmm. um, in my study um it was a daily behavior that we asked people to do um and it was a small study and the range we we modeled their time for it to reach the highest point for each person um and the model time ranged from 18 to 254 days. Mm. So it was, there was an average, so it was 66 days. So that's what, what comes up if you Google it. Mm. Um, you either get 21 days or you get my 66 days. Yeah. Um, but um, we actually, when we published the paper, we specifically didn't put the number in the abstract because we knew that's what people would focus on. But of course they still did. Yeah. Um, because it's you know it's a, it, it it is an inter i mean and that's why i did the study because i wanted to ask i wanted to ask the question um and there have been a few more more recent studies that are getting similar ish numbers sometimes a bit more sometimes a bit less um but i think what's important when talking to patients or anybody who's trying to form a habit is that they understand that it's not going to happen overnight and that you do have to maintain intentional control you have to you have to get yourself to do it somehow um, for quite a while but the point is that if you can do that it will then get easier um, and then as long as this your, your situations and your settings don't change um, you you will be able to maintain it long term um, so yeah there's no nice answer but a while and but it but it does happen um, and then and then once it's a habit it's great. And having habits is a really good way to maintain self-control. So there's some great research now that shows that the people who are good at self-control, we have this image of people who are good at self-control as sort of being great at resisting temptation. So they're great. If there's that great delicious muffin next to them, they're, they're brilliant and they cannot eat it. Now, to some extent that might be true, but actually more, it's the case that that muffin's not there. <laughs> because they've mm. they created the context so that so that it's not there and also they have such a strong habit for eating an apple even if the muffin is there they don't even really see it because when you have a habit you don't notice the alternatives you just get on with that one behavior so if I always drive to work it doesn't occur to me that I could walk or I could get a bus or I could ride my bike I just get in the car because that's what I do and if I eat a piece of fruit at 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm not thinking about, well, I could be eating a donut or I could be eating some crisps. I just eat the fruit. Mm -hmm. And so habits are a really great way to enable you to sort of meet your goals and be the person that you want to be. They just take a bit of work in the initial stages, but the payoff is, is worth it. Well, thank you, Pippa. Thank you so much for that answer. I think it's a, um, it might not be the quote unquote nice answer that people are looking for, the, the Google, the, the, the answer that's easy to Google, but I think it's very important to have a realistic, um, to have a realistic view of what's really going on in general, um, you know, trying to think things through and really try to, to look for the answers that are as closest to the truth as possible. And I think that what, that's what research really does. And most of the time we don't get these needs nice answers that we that we would like to hear from from research papers so i think it's um i think it was it's very very valuable the information that you that you share and the research that you do i have as i said i when i when i researched um your work i i was blown away by all the all the incredible papers that you've published and i saw that you've published a paper i think it's still a preprint uh, together with benjamin gardner 
um, just just last month, I think in March, you published a new paper, which I downloaded the preprint and, and I'm very, very curious to read it. And um, so, yeah, thank you very much for your work. And also thank you very much for uh, your time and uh, for being a guest on our podcast. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Okay, so there you have it. Another urban legend dismissed. It doesn't take 21 days to form a new habit. Now, obviously, this wasn't the only relevant information that Pippa shared with us today. I think that her work and her publications really give us a better understanding of how we can use habit formation to live healthier and maybe even more fulfilled lives ourselves and how we can help our patients do the same. Now, if you would like to learn more about Pippa's work, make sure to follow her on Twitter at Pippa Lely. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can find a link to her publications in the description box below. Now, I will go out for a run now because this is a new habit I'm forming every time I record a podcast. See you next time.